just because the slaves had been freed, it didn't mean that they were going to have equal rights. After the Civil War, you had formerly enslaved Americans that were just really set out to fend on their own. They had been separated from their families. They didn't have jobs for the most part. They did not know how to read and write. African Americans had to begin to work hard just to become citizens of this country. They needed to be educated. They needed to be given health care. And most importantly, they needed jobs. Uh, and what skills do they have for the jobs that might be there. The system of sharecropping formed shortly after the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation freed Southern slaves. The whole labor process after the Civil War for free people goes through stages. You know, first it's that contract uh, that the Freedmen's Bureau is helping to negotiate. Then you start to see in some of the labor contracts uh, something that approaches what we'll eventually call sharecropping. Because I was a slave, I don't own any land. I don't own a home. I don't own much of anything. For 20 years, I had been a slave. I'd been involved in agricultural labor, but you can't farm without land. And because one of the failures of the Freedmen's Bureau was its efforts to redistribute abandoned and confiscated lands uh, because they were reclaimed by their Confederate owners, you find that free blacks' only recourse is to become a part of the system where I get to farm your land, and in exchange, you are promised a portion of my harvest which sounds really good, but I don't have any power in that, one, I have to farm your land, two, I need supplies to farm your land, which means I probably am running up a credit with you, three, you're the one that's keeping track of the credit, and four, I'm gonna probably have to sell my crop to you anyway, and uh, you're, so you're gonna tell me what is valued, you're gonna take whatever portion of it that you want, and I might be upside down at the end of every season, which means that instead of you owing me, I now owe you. And uh, attached to that, um, this horrible cycle of debt is really the perilousness of agriculture and farming, because I can't guarantee a good season. I can't guarantee there's not going to be a drought, there's not going to be a rain, there's not going to be a bug that comes in and swallows up the crop. Sharecropping was a terribly unfair cruel institution. The sharecroppers were never able to make enough money to buy pieces of land and thus they were held to the land in a situation not unlike slavery. Another thing to include in that is everybody was hurt because in some places in Tennessee, Mississippi and so on, the majority of sharecroppers were white. Poverty was stalking the South after Reconstruction among whites and blacks, but it was worse among black sharecroppers because now they had no political rights, they had no economic rights whatsoever. And many felt like they'd been promised land by the Union Army, like General Sherman's Field Order 15 promised to distribute land in 40-acre plots to former slaves. But that didn't happen, either through the Freedmen's Bureau or anywhere else. Instead, President Johnson ordered all land returned to its former owners, so the South remained largely agricultural, with the same people owning the same land, and in the end, we ended up with sharecropping. Let's go to the thought bubble. The system of sharecropping replaced slavery in many places throughout the South. Landowners would provide housing to the sharecroppers. No, thought bubble, not quite that nice. There you go. Also tools and seed, and then the sharecroppers received, get this, a share of their crop, usually between a third and a half, with the price for that harvest often set by the landowner. Freed blacks got to control their work, and plantation owners got a steady workforce that couldn't easily leave because they had little opportunity to save money and make the big capital investments in, like, land or tools. By the late 1860s, poor white farmers were sharecropping as well. In fact, by the Great Depression, most sharecroppers were white. And while sharecropping certainly wasn't slavery, it did result in a quasi-serfdom that tied workers to land they didn't own. Former slave owners couldn't imagine the idea of bargaining on any kind of basis with former slaves. And they believed that the only way they could continue to grow cotton was to force African Americans to work. They had to find some kind of coercive mechanism. The sharecropping system basically allowed farm workers to trade their labor for crops. African American workers, they don't have tools, they can't supply themselves with seed and other equipment. This is supplied by the landowner. From almost the first moment, white Southerners were try to put African Americans back into a position as close to slavery as they possibly could. The Old South and what was quickly becoming the New South could not proceed without uh, the work of African Americans. 
But if you had something for free in the past, you don't necessarily want to pay for it now. It was a straight, simple, exploitative system. There was only power, there was only force, and there was only brutality. Northern workers were fearful of competition with newly freed slaves for work, and northern capitalists saw the need for continued cotton production. As a result, African Americans, along with the poor, were coerced virtually into re-enslavement. The oppressor almost never abandons the oppression. They move, they move from one form of oppression to another form. The law of sharecropping emerges over time. Okay. What you have is a lot of uncertainty, people being promised wages and not being paid, or people saying, we'll work, we'll, we'll try and keep on as we did, and some kind of informal arrangement. It takes time for the law of sharecropping to emerge. And it emerges because landowners don't have money to pay, and the free people have no land of their own. They, they don't have the basis for that independence because promises made during the Civil War about land or cheap land being available to the free people were not kept. The, the Freedmen's Bureau is the Freedmen's Bureau of Refugees and Abandoned Lands. Many had hoped that some of those abandoned lands, these were lands that had been confiscated during the war, would be sold very cheaply or perhaps given the whole idea of 40 acres and a mule to the free people. When that didn't emerge, people realized they had little choice but to work for former uh, slave owners. Their options were, were often quite few because if you didn't have a skill, growing cotton was the one thing you learned how to do. After this initial period of movement, um, searching for something different, wanting to see the city, wanting to see something different, people would perhaps return to the communities where, that they knew best and try and strike a good bargain or agreement with former landowners. So landowners who don't have money, free people who need to survive, come up really with this bargain called sharecropping. A sharecropper will agree to work for a percentage of the proceeds of the cotton, um, of the sale of the cotton crop. And so you're not paid, you're not a wage worker, you're not paid wages, and you don't own the land, but you're allowed to live there and work the crop, and then you get a proceed once that crop is sold. Civil War Amendments, beginning with the 13th Amendment in 1865 and ending with the 15th Amendment in 1870. The three Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, all sought in their own ways to ensure equality for African Americans in the South after the Civil War. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment granted African Americans citizenship. The 15th Amendment outlawed discrimination in voting rights. Contrary to popular belief, the 15th Amendment does not grant the right to vote to anyone. It simply outlaws discrimination in voting based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Congress failed to provide enforcement for the amendment originally. Enforcement did not come until 1870 with the passage of the Enforcement Acts of 1870 and the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. Although formally ratified in February of 1870, African Americans were still denied the right to vote by a variety of means by Southern states. These included things like the poll tax and literacy test. In 1865 and early 1866, these new governments in the South, all white governments created by Andrew Johnson, you know, going to have to deal with the situation of the former slaves. What is their status going to be? What rights are they going to have? And so they pass these laws to regulate the conditions of the former slaves. So the black codes are really an attempt to use the power of the government to get the plantation system going again. Not as slave labor, that's gone, but as forced labor, where blacks would be paid some minimal wage, but they would have no alternative but to go to work for white employers. They don't go into effect. In fact, in early 1866, Congress passes the Civil Rights Law, which actually says that all laws must apply equally to all citizens. And that abrogates all these black codes, because they're only for blacks. But they're important as a sign of what the white South has in mind for blacks, unless the federal government comes in and protects them. Now, they give them some rights. They're no longer slaves. They can't be bought and sold that marriages are now going to be legally recognized as they weren't under slavery. They can own property in some states. Actually, Mississippi barred them from owning land. But that's it. They had no right to vote. They had no right to serve on juries. They had no right to testify in court in cases involving white people. They could not own guns the way white people could. And most importantly, they had to go to work for white people. They had to sign year-long labor contracts with a white employer. 
Otherwise, they would be called vagrants, arrested, fined, and if they couldn't pay the fine, they'd be auctioned off to some white person who could pay the fine. So in other words, a black guy would land working for himself, that's illegal. You've got to work for a white employer. He'd be arrested as a vagrant and sold to a white employer, basically. They couldn't go to work for themselves. They couldn't follow a trade, something like that. That's why Mississippi barred them from even owning land, so that they had no alternative but to work for white planters. So the black codes are a very, very restrictive idea of what freedom really would mean for these former slaves. By the 20s, nearly half a million African-American workers left the South for industrial opportunities in northern cities. In the midst of the 1930 Depression, an underground armed movement erupted. An organized alliance of tenant farmers known as the Sharecroppers Union created by the Communist Party of the USA formed in an attempt to demand rights for sharecroppers. By 1936, the union expanded to include over 12,000 members throughout the Deep South. Members endured murderous attacks from mobs and sheriffs. Some sharecroppers fought back, resulting in casualties on both sides. 